Welcome to We Plus You, straight talk about conscious business collaborations. And I am very excited today. Today I have the wonderful Bob Byrne, who is the author of Go Giver, which I actually love because it is a phenomenal book. It is written by Bob Berg himself, obviously, and co-authored by John David Mann. And today, however, we're going to be talking about his new book, which I'm very excited about, Adversaries into Alleys. And this book, if you have not read it, I advise you to go get it because it will change your life about communication and more. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Carly. Always great to be with you. Oh, I am always delighted to have you. I've interviewed many times, and everyone is different every interview. There isn't one interview that is the same, and I'm very excited about that. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to start with what was the inspiration behind this book? Well, in the first place, I just think it's, it's an important topic. I, mean, I think you can have practically all the success skills. Uh, you, know, you can be very talented, and a very high, extremely high character. Uh, you can be ambitious, kind, charitable, hardworking, thrifty, energetic. You can have a knack for numbers and a head for business. You can be even-tempered, and you can be uh, creative and much, much more, and all that's great. It, in fact, it's terrific. However, unless you can influence others, uh, move people to the desired and appropriate action, uh, then it's really difficult to achieve any kind of really significant uh, success. On the other hand, when combining benevolent intent and a learned skill set, you can find yourself constantly, consistently, and even predictably uh, attaining results that you want, both business-wise and personally, uh, while adding exceptional value to everyone who's, whose lives you touch. Now, I was very fortunate because you know, I grew up with great parents, and my dad, who, you know, I really take after my dad and that I sort of uh, I am in the spotlight and more of a, a public uh, uh, face, if you will, and I really was able to observe watching my dad, the guy who has the greatest people skills I've ever seen, and I, and I think in my dad's case, it was very intuitive. He just had a gift, uh, and still does to this day, of being able to really genuinely bring out the best in people, uh, get the results he wanted while making them genuinely feel good about themselves, about the situation, and about him. And I was able to pick up on that. And it's not that I always lived like that, because I think I resisted it for a long time. But once I really you know, came to, to discover that that's the way to live a much more productive life, a, uh, a happier life, a more successful life, I made a real study out of it. And, uh, so I, you know, I got to really uh, observe it all the time from watching my dad, and I also studied the classics of the field, you know, uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, Les Giblin's How to Have confidence and power in dealing with people and, and all the books of you know people like Ben Franklin and Abraham Lincoln and people throughout history who had wonderful people skills so so really it's a it's a joy for me to do I just I love this topic and I think it's a necessary one uh, you know for everyone to, to, to possess so the one thing I also want to say before I forget the one thing I love about this book you've been coined as endless referrals and you obviously are extremely adept at sales and those other books that you've written that are absolutely fabulous. And I encourage anyone who hasn't read all of Bob, Berg, Bob Berg's books to actually go out and read them because if you are in sales and any of that type of work that you're doing, I encourage you to read them. What I love about this book, it really does cross you over from just doing books that are about sales into the self-development because you really do focus a lot about communication skills in this book and obviously a lot of other things as well. So I, I would love for you to start with because right at the beginning of the book, we talk about the five principles. Can you touch upon the five principles in this book? Uh, sure. The, the five principles, and I utilize those, Carly, because I want people to be able to come away after reading this book saying, you know what, I already know how to do that. And, and, and it's all familiar to them. And the stories that we use in the book are just real-life stories that people can see themselves doing, and it, it's easy to apply. So I began with the five principles because these five principles will pretty much always come into play in practically any potentially difficult interpersonal situation. So these are sort of the foundational principles that will allow people to then be able to 
uh, apply this. So the five principles themselves, uh, number one is control your own emotions. Number two is understand the clash of belief systems. Number three is acknowledge their ego. Number four is set the proper frame. And number five is communicate with tact and empathy. Well, let's get a little bit into that because those are really foundational things. If you cannot control your emotions and if you cannot set the frame, and you know, let's let's get into a little bit of those you know conversations because I think those are foundational pieces. The sages asked, "Who is a mighty person?" And they answered, "That person who can control their own emotions and make of an enemy or of a potential enemy a friend." It all begins there. It all begins there because as human beings, Carly, we are emotional beings, if you will. I, you know, we're, we're logical, but really we're emotional. And we make our decisions, most of them emotionally, even and especially very important decisions. We make them emotionally and then we back up those emotional decisions with logic or we could say we rationalize. And if you break up the word rationalize, it simply means we tell ourselves rational lies. And we do this quite a bit. Now, emotions also are something that are triggered off in us. Now, you know, there's the old saying, nobody can make you angry. Nobody can make you sad. Nobody can make you feel badly about yourself. But you know what? They can sure push certain buttons that, that we then do it to ourselves and based on our own feelings and, and thoughts about ourselves. So, so what we need to do is understand that, that when our emotions are controlling us, we're not in a position to be able to be uh, solution-oriented. Um, so we say, you know, it, and it's not in any way, you know, I mean, emotions are a great thing. They're part of what makes wor life worthwhile. As one of my great mentors, Dondi Scumachi, and you know Dondi, as, as she says, hey, emotions are wonderful. Take them along for the ride, but make sure you're driving the car. And that's so important. So we first, it all starts with controlling our own emotions. Uh, my dad calls it being the boss of yourself, because only when you're the boss of yourself are you in a position to be able to take a, a potentially negative situation and turn it into something positive. The, the late, great Zig Ziglar uh, used to refer to this as the difference between reacting and responding. You know, I was going to go there. I was going to say we should tie that into the reacting and responding, which is further in your book, and I think that does tie into that piece. Yeah, and, and what he says, and I, I love this, and, and I'll tell you, this advice really saved me a lot of uh, counterproductive actions. <laughs> when I learned this from Zig years ago, listening to one of his, his uh, tapes, not even CDs, tapes, that's how long ago this was, he talked about reacting being negative, responding being positive. Why? Well, when you react, you're allowing someone else to control you. When you respond, you're in control. And he used to give a great example. He'd say, uh, you know, did you, did the medicate, did you respond well to the medication or did it cause a bad reaction? And that's really the difference between re reacting and responding. So it begins with controlling your emotions. And once you can do that, now you're in a position to, to work well with someone. Well, let's go into further. You were talking about the framing. Um, well, you want to go to the second one? The yeah, let's system? go into that. Right yeah. well, These are foundational pieces, I think, that are really core, actually laying the foundation for the rest of the book, as far as I'm concerned. Because if you don't have these foundational pieces, in, in my point of view anyway, these are foundational pieces, as far as I'm concerned, for life. Oh, I, I agree. And the second one is, is understand the clash of belief systems. First, what is a belief? Well, a belief is it's a, a subjective truth. It's the truth as you see the truth is being, which doesn't necessarily mean it is the truth. It's just how we see it through our lens. Our belief system is really the lens through which we see the world, the paradigm, if you will, the, the model of the world. Now, our belief system is something that is, is given to us from the time we're born, and it develops over time. It, uh, it really, you could say your belief system is the combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, news media, television shows, movies, popular entertainment, popular culture, popular mores, uh, everything you touch, taste, see, uh, smell, or in the other fifth sense that I'm not remake here. Uh, it's, everything is belief systems. Now, we get it at a very young age because we're not even aware of it. 
okay? It's handed to us. It's given to us first by family and then our immediate friends and environment. And what happens is we grow up with this belief system, this way of looking at the world, Carly, and we have not critically looked at the information that's come into our mind, okay? We haven't said, hmm, why is that so? Uh, why should I believe that? Uh, how did this person come up with that, right? It, it, no, it just goes into the, into the mind and it becomes a belief. It's our truth. So we're basically, that's our, you know, in a sense, that's our, our operating system. It's, it's, it, it's what run, we run on and we don't even know. So we're, we're not even aware that we are basically the servant of an operating system, okay? Now, here's the other thing. So is the other person. See, they grew up with their own belief system, and they're not aware of that. They're not conscious of it. They're not thinking of it. Here's the other thing. As human beings, we tend to believe that everybody else sees the world as we see the world. Uh, example, have you ever caught yourself saying, everybody feels that way, or nobody feels that way? I would never say that to anyone, and we assume the other person wouldn't either, but they would. And so we're different. We come from different belief systems, but we don't realize it. So when we're about to have, or when we're in the middle of a, uh, of a, a difficult conversation, if you will, or a difficult, potentially difficult interpersonal transaction, it's, Carly, it's not that we need to understand that other person's belief system. But we probably don't even understand our own belief system totally. But we need to understand that their belief system is probably much different than our belief system. And as long as we understand that, we're in a position to work within that, that environment. Now, wouldn't you say that ties into a conversation we've had a long time ago, a little bit about mind viruses? Sure. Well, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Randy Gage, talks about memes or mind viruses. And that's really what it is. It's those unconscious things that have been placed in there without our even being aware of them. Uh, and again, we get it from really from everywhere. And, you know, and every so often, it, you know, it can serve us a belief we're not aware we have, sir, but not usually. And it, it's, it's rarely good when it's unconscious. So we could have some mind virus about, about money, about relationships, about this, about that. We don't even know we have them. And yet, we're run by them. And that's when it's dangerous. It's, it's really not being conscious. It's not being aware of not being aware. I agree with that. Now, the other thing, I, since we're on that topic, I'd really like to get into, because this is a big one, is the persuasion versus manipulation. Because a lot of people think that they're persuading and they're really not even realizing that unconsciously they're manipulating. Let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, when you think of it, influence is simply the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, now, usually within the context of a specific goal. Now, you can, you can either influence, in, in my opinion, through persuasion, which is positive, uh, or manipulation, which is negative. Now, People will ask, well, aren't the two the same? Well, I don't believe they are, um, but I remember years ago first being asked that question. And even though I always thought, you know, persuasion is positive and malicious is negative, I'd say, well, why? What's the difference? I, I couldn't really answer it definitively. And, and there's a saying which I subscribe to, and that is if you can't answer, if you can't explain something and explain it simply, you might not understand it as well as you think you do. So I sort of went on a quest to really find a great explanation uh, between the two. And I, I read a, a terrific book years ago. It was actually written in 1987 by a, a guy named Dr. Paul uh, W. Sweats called The Art of Talking So That People Will Listen. Although the book, how, the book was much more about listening, not talking, as you can imagine. But it was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, and what Dr. Sweat, and he gave what I thought was the best definition uh, or best explanation I'd ever heard. So, so this is actually Dr. Sweat. Do Dr. Sweat said, manipulation aims at control, not cooperation. It does not consider the good of the other party, and it typically results in a win-lose situation. In contrast to the manipulator, the persuader always seeks to enhance the self-esteem of the other party. The result is that people respond better 
because they're treated as responsible, response-able, self-directing individuals. So to me, the biggest difference between the two is intent, but it's more than that. It's also results, because a manipulator can, can get someone to take a certain action immediately, and so can a persuader, okay? But longer term, uh, it's not going to work out nearly as well for the manipulator. I mean, think about it. A manipulator can have employees, but very rarely uh, a, a, a team of loyal, committed people. Uh, a manipulator can make sales, but very rarely have a happy customer uh, or a personal walking ambassador that refers them to others. And even in terms of family, a manipulator can have a family they love and a family that loves them, but very rarely is it a, a functional kind of situation. It tends to be sort of dysfunctional. So um, there's really a huge difference, and it, it begins with intent, but then uh, its results as well. Let's get into sharing with people how to deal with setting the proper frame. This is very important. What What is a frame? Uh, a frame is a premise, if you will. It's the foundation from which everything else uh, evolves. Uh, let me give you a, a, a quick example. I was in a, a Dunkin' Donuts, and you know me, Carly. You know I'm, I'm always in Dunkin' Donuts. And uh, there was a little boy, probably two years old, a little bit older, and he was walking around the restaurant. He was walking toward his parents. And all of a sudden, he uh, took a spill. You know, he, he fell down. And he wasn't hurt, but you could, but he was shocked. You know, you could tell he knew that wasn't supposed to happen, right? And so he looked at his parents for their interpretation of the event. See, the event was what it was, but he looked at them for the interpretation of the event. Now, had the parents, uh, you know, gotten upset and said, oh, no, my poor baby, and oh, you must be so hurt, he probably would have gotten upset and started crying. But what they did, they handled it beautifully. And they said, oh, you know that, oh, that looks like so much fun, good job, and wow, that's great. And they smiled, and he smiled, and giggled, and laughed, and had fun. What they did is they set a, a productive, constructive frame, and that's key. And so what we always want to do is be sure we set the frame in any interpersonal transaction. It might be as simple as a warm and friendly smile. Okay, and and it might be a you know just a, a a greeting. It might be whatever it is. It might be an attitude. But what we also need to be able to do is reset another person's negative frame, because while we're looking to set a proper frame, someone else might come to this transaction uh, without a good frame, without a positive frame. So if we buy into the, if we react and buy into their frame, their control, their negativity is going to control the outcome. Okay. If we instead respond to this and and reset the frame, uh, the chances are it's going to work out a lot better. Uh, may I share a, a a quick example? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was I was uh, pulling into the parking lot of a hotel where I had a meeting, and there was I was um, pulling into the actual parking space, and I really wasn't paying attention uh, as I as I should have been. And I nearly clipped a guy as he was getting out of his out of the driver's side of his car. I almost hit him. And he just, you know, he reacted to who could blame him, but he shot me a just a nasty, nasty look. Uh, now he reacted. Again, who, who could blame him? He, he was scared. He almost got hit by a car. And it was my fault. And, you know, so he shot me this nasty, you know, if looks could kill, right, as the saying goes. And, and so had I reacted to that react, in other words, had I bought into that frame because he was in a, hateful frame, a nasty frame, a scared, you know, a scared frame, anger frame. Had I bought it, had I reacted and bought into that, I was like, what are you looking at? And he was said, you almost hit me now, you know, and so forth. It might not have been road rage, but it would have been parking lot rage, or if that's even a name. But it, it, at best, it would have been uncomfortable. At worst, it could have been a really lousy situation and outcome. Instead, what I did is I responded, and I reset the frame. I simply smiled, had an apologetic smile, raised my hand, and through the, the window, I just mouthed the words, sorry. And immediately he went, no problem. Now, you know, that's that's all there was. I mean, what happened? Instead of buying into him, reacting and buying into his frame, I responded and was able to reset his frame 
uh, and turned it from one to an adversary into one of an ally. And that goes into what I am going to say is, is body language. We do not pay attention to people's body language. And like you, if you're walking down the street, if you notice, if you smile to the person that's walking across from you, you know, if you're just walking down, you know, one person's going this way and you're coming this way, if you smile, you'll notice, even if the other person wasn't smiling, if you smile, they'll smile back. Even if they look like they are having a frown, we don't realize the impact of our response. So if you see someone with their arms are crossed, you know, we have to look at people's body language. And you're right, we can reset their body language by our body language. And we, we, we as humans don't pay enough attention to that. So if we're walking into a meeting, we automatically see someone's body language that's closed off. We have the chance to reset that body language. Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually, it is, it's, it's amazing what we can do with our body language and how our attitude is. Mm -hmm. so I, often, I, I love that. Yeah, yeah I, I often say a smile is the ultimate positive frame setter. And it's also yes. a great frame resetter. Daniel Goleman in his landmark book, Emotional Intelligence, and actually in, this quote was from uh, Working with Emotional Intelligence, his, his following book. Uh, he says, a smile is one of, the, w one of the, uh, those triggers that is almost impossible to resist. When someone smiles at you, it's oh, not impossible. And some people, but for most people, you smile at them and they will smile back. It's and people an amazing say, by the way, well, and, well, people ask, well, but shouldn't the other person take responsibility to do that? Well, maybe they should, but they don't. And so that's why it's up to us to be that person who, who, who does it. What, is, what would you say is one of the biggest things you'd like people to take away from this book? Uh, that's a great question. And it might be that the whole key is focusing on the other person. That while it's up to us to be that positive persuader, while it's up to us to be that positive influencer, the focus is always on the, the other person. You know, uh, there's a, a big difference between someone committing to an action that you've asked them to take and someone simply complying with an action that you've either forced them to take or, you know, based on positional influence or a, a position, been able to, to force them to take. Huge difference between commitment and compliance. Uh, I love what, what again, Dondi Scumachi says about this. Uh, she's so brilliant. Uh, Dondi says, compliance will never take you where commitment can go. The reason why, because when, it, when someone does something out of compliance, uh, at best they're going to do exactly what they're told, and at worst they'll find a way to sabotage the process completely, uh, consciously or, or unconsciously. Commitment, though, is really so much different. Uh, that's when a, people, a, a person has really bought in to that particular action. And I think this commitment is, is always the result of the influencer um, embracing Dale Carnegie's famous admonition from his classic How to Win Friends and Influence People where he wrote, ultimately, people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. So the great influencer, the one who is just terrific when it comes to, to gaining commitment from others, they constantly ask them, they constantly question themselves, Carly. Uh, how does what I'm asking this person to do, uh, how is that congruent with their goals, with their needs, with their wants, with their desires? How does, does what, I'm, what I want this other human being to do, how does that align with their values. And when asking ourselves these questions intelligently and authentically, not as a way to manipulate another human being into doing our will, but to help them to grow, to help build them. And when we do this, now we've gone a long way toward earning that commitment. And the greatest of leaders and the greatest of influencers, uh, they understand that, that when it comes right down to it, it's not about them. It's not about this. I mean, well, who is it about? Well, you know who it's about. It's about the other person. It's about everyone whose lives you choose to touch. It's about everyone whose lives you choose to add value to. And this could be anyone. It could be a family member or a friend. It could be your coworker, your boss, your 
your uh, you know employee. It, it it could be the vendor, it could be the the committee person, it could be that government bureaucrat who's who's not making it easy, or the customer disservice person who's making it difficult to return an item. So what we need to do is focus on them, and how do we how do we find out what motivates them to take the appropriate action? So what I would like to end with because what you just addressed is actually tying into the character of the ultimate influencer. So let's address some of those characters. Well, you know, character itself comes from an old Greek word for scrape or scratch. Uh, it came to mean an engraved marking and eventually a defining quality. Now perhaps more accurately we might say the sum total of all one's qualities is their defining quality. And I think with people of, of high character, uh, they, they tend to really stand for something. And with people of high character, you tend to know exactly where they stand. Uh, as such, you can predict their decisions. And, and I'm not talking about the everyday minutiae type decisions, but the big decisions. Because while certainly people of character make mistakes, you know, who doesn't? Uh, and while they will course correct, uh, while, while they will be flexible on methodology, they will be rigid when it comes to principle. When it comes to doing the right thing, they're going to do it. And, you know, I think in a sense when we look at what influences others, certainly, you know, what we say is important, uh, but it's probably the least important. What you do, more important, but really it's who you are. And that's character. And I think people are more influenced by character than by anything else. And you, my sir, are definitely a character. <laughs> I've been called a character many times. <laughs> I, I really want, um, please tell people where they can find you, because this is also a podcast. So where can people find Bob Berg, and where can they get your book? I And I also don't want to, you know, please also mention The Go-Giver, because, yes, this book is, I have to say, Adversaries into Alleys is a phenomenal book. Please let people know also about The Go-Giver because The Go-Giver will also change your life. And I don't have The Go-Giver right in front of me because it's on my bookshelf. But please make sure you go check out The Go-Giver as well. Please make sure to read Adversaries into Alleys. And please let people know where they can find you because this is also a podcast. Sure. The best thing to do is just go to Berg. Dot com and that's b u r g dot com and while there they can click on the the picture of the the book the photo of the book and that will take them to a page where they can get chapter one if they'd like to read that first to see if they like where it's going and from there they can always click through to buy online or to to go to their local bookseller while they're on berg dot com they can also uh, download my influence and success insights in which they can also download chapter one of the go giver and a couple of my other books. My blog is there with about 400 archived articles, and they can connect with me on social media. Everything's right on that home page at uh, burg.com, so I invite people to, to come around and have some fun. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's always a joy to have you on, and uh, I look forward to many other books to review and read, and thank you so much for joining your, just you know, spending time with me. It's always a joy. I appreciate you greatly, my terrific friend. Thank you for all you do. Well, have a beautiful afternoon, and I look forward to next time. Thank you. Good night, everybody.